Thank you guys for having me here. I'm really excited. Uh, this is my second time to London, and so I always get excited when you've been to London. Uh, so my, hello, everyone. My name is Dheeraj, and today I'm going to talk about content security policy. So we, uh, we'll be discussing about a lot, lot many offensive and defensive strategies to uh, secure web application, and we'll also be talking about um, security best practices, which you can apply to secure our web applications, and with the help of content security policies, by adding an additional layer of defense. Uh, before we get started, uh, I, just a quick raise of hands. How many have heard about content security policy before? All right, almost everyone. And how many of you have actually deployed CSP uh, to production? All right, and without breaking the production? <laughs> no one? All right, great. A little introduction about me, like who is this random guy on stage talking about security. Um, I work for a company called Wingify, that's in India. It's very well known for its A-B testing uh, product, that is VWO. I take care of uh, application security there. And before moving completely into security, I was a front-end artisan, uh, working with uh, AngularJS and Vanilla JavaScript. And I also do uh, open source stuff, like recently I published uh, a CLI that, uh, to read uh, awesome medium stories without really, uh, letting your boss know about it. Uh, and also I ma maintain a list of comprehensive bug bounty programs on GitHub. And I can also play table tennis uh, with both of my hands, switching in between. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, a little more, uh, when I'm not writing code, uh, I try to find vulnerabilities in web applications. And uh, these are the applications where, uh, some of the applications where I've reported uh, security issues. And most of my attacks have been on the client side where you must have seen this little pop-up uh, from the browser window. And <coughs> So uh, today's agenda for the talk is uh, to understand what basically security is and why is it necessary. And before getting into content security policy, we really, we really need to understand what type of attacks it solves. And moreover, it's like uh, cross-site scripting and other injection attacks and how to mitigate those uh, attacks using CSP and how, do you, how do you deploy CSP without breaking production. Uh, and also we'll be talking about crypto jacking. How many of you have not heard about crypto jacking before? All right, so uh, in the recent past, actually the last week, uh, more than 4,000 uh, websites got hit by crypto jacking where, uh, you know, if you visit a website uh, that's infected website, the malicious JavaScript could actually uh, run and mine uh, cryptocurrencies in your browser. and. <coughs> And this practice of secretly loading JavaScript in your browser is uh, known as crypto jacking or in drive-in mining. Uh, similarly, and good, uh, some couple of months back, uh, WordPress, WordPress blogs were known to uh, have recording of uh, user credentials, and which is very dangerous because it acts like a, a key loggers, uh, and we were sending the uh, credentials to some other attackers and points. And security is important. Um, and most of the times which I have seen that uh, security is like an elephant in the room where everyone agrees to it, but only a few uh, takes it very seriously. And uh, since the first time your app is compromised, uh, you lose most of your uh, users. They no longer trust your app or uh, you. And security is always uh, uh, takes priority uh, uh, when some bad happens. Uh, and before that, it always takes a back seat in most of the cases, and especially when you talk about startups or who, who want to uh, you know, create some uh, uh, basic products. So, and uh, interestingly, one of the things where <coughs> most of us uh, developers think that security is all about backend, but uh, actually with lots of frameworks coming out in JavaScript and uh, attacks happening on the browser level, like crypto jacking, which I have mentioned, uh, you cannot neglect front-end security. And, and you can see that uh, JavaScript frameworks uh, 
uh, like every new, uh, uh, every day we have seen uh, new JavaScript frameworks coming out. And <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, cross-site scripting. Uh, so when we, uh, when we talk about any client-side or browser-level attack, the XSX is the first vulnerability that comes to uh, everyone's minds. And uh, this, is, uh, this is so popular that I have known some uh, person who have been doing PhD in uh, XSX, so it's so 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 com complex, and it's <coughs> and so some years ago, where people used to disable JavaScript to mitigate all this browser level risk, but nowadays with uh, with uh, such uh, new browsers, we cannot uh, remove JavaScript to uh, compromise with the user experience, and that's the we have to enable uh, all the JavaScript. Uh, to on a browser, and that's 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 the vulnerability that occurs when uh, basically your data become code or your code becomes data. And when I talk about data, it's mostly the data coming from an attacker uh, who has bad intentions. And <laughs> so, for example, where you can see this uh, uh, little script of code uh, which is loading and trying to load an image which doesn't exist and and using an on error attribute is be able to uh, show a little pop-up. And this little pop-up was shown on our website, uh, uber.com. And I'm sure everyone heard about that. And this dashboard where I had reported this vulnerability a couple of years back, where, uh, where I just tried to set my uh, name as uh, this little piece of code. And, and when I tried to uh, when any other user try to remove m uh, my project or my name or my cringe, my user, this this little pop-up would occur. And similarly, uh, <coughs> I have reported the vulnerabilities to some uh, other websites. Like one of the interesting uh, one I remember is uh, Recruiter Box, which is an Indian platform for uh, hiring hiring platform where I was able to inject in one library uh, malicious code using which I was able to take a job at any 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 of the openings on their website. And that's how cool and I would be able to place at some good company. Uh, and so it's not about uh, the just the pop-up, it's more than that. It's basically attack users, it has access to your DOM, it can uh, hijack the sessions, it can steal the cookies or steal the information, and it can even record your sessions. And moreover, it can even uh, lead to uh, crypto jacking. And <laughs> so, a typical reflected access X uh, looks like this, where someone send you a malicious code, and you click on that, and it would try to get all your cookies, which might also have your session cookies, and send it over to attacker. And this basically uh, cookie would let anyone, uh, th if the cookie is having the ses session cookie, and then it would let uh, attackers to have control over your session. Uh, so. Uh, We'll be seeing a, a live demonstration how this vulnerability occurs, so to have a complete understanding about it. Uh, so I'm running a very basic uh, vulnerable applications where you have uh, search features to, that's basically a very common search feature. We can have find it on any website or any blogs running on WordPress or any other things. And if you just try to say, hey, hello, and it will just show you the output. So why don't we try something else? Where I have already POCs. Uh, and if you try to do something else, it show a little pop-up. And this is basically due to cross-site scripting and developers forget to escape the user input. And like I was mentioning, uh, when your data becomes code, it can lead to cross-site scripting. And this little piece of code becomes dangerous because when you share this particular URL to someone and they open this URL, and the script would get executed. And this is a typical reflected access X where a user input is uh, being rendered uh, by the application. And this is how uh, XSX attack occurs. Uh, 
getting back to the slides. Uh, so how do we uh, mitigate such type of attacks uh, where uh, we can have HTTP only cookies, uh, which can uh, sorry, which can lead to uh, we can make sure that your browser doesn't uh, get access to those cookies. So it's very uh, useful to put uh, HTTP only cookies uh, for your session cookies, HTTP only flag for your session cookies, and then one can do input sanitization at the backend so that any malicious uh, input doesn't occur. But in the demo which we have seen, the input was never going to the backend, and it is basically a type of uh, XSX that is DOM, DOM XSX, and it, does, it means that it doesn't necessary to, uh, it doesn't help to sanitize the input on the backend because the input would never reach to that, and it it occurs when. Uh, uh, the vulnerability exists because of on the fly creating DOM elements. And so that's the reason uh, you have to analyze places where DOM elements are created on the fly. And the correct defense for XSX is to construct HTML securely in a framework that automatically escapes uh, untrusted user data and which should be followed by a good uh, DOM sanitizer as a second layer of defense. And but that's really a problem because of uh, escaping gotchas and different browser quirks. And it's very difficult to get it right. And XSX is maybe a much solved problem if we do all these <laughs> the right things. But then people think that they understand JavaScript. And it's kind of funny because it's true, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you must be wondering about this particular little piece of code and trying in your uh, developer tools, but I would say it works. Uh, and <clears throat> now, <sighs> when we say that this is a little problem, we have content security policy. And so let's get started with CSP. It's uh, basically a standard which allows you to define resources uh, loaded on your website. It can be set via HTTP response header or something very similar to HSTS. And it can also be set via um, meta tags, which is very useful in the cases where you do not have access to the servers. For example, uh, GitHub pages. And you would be able to uh, specify content security policy just using the meta tags. And it should never be a first line of defense and uh, because XSX can <coughs> actually occur if you do not uh, deploy CSP very correctly. So it should always be a defense in depth strategy. And <coughs> CSP also has to be issued on every page because browser doesn't cache it. Like, uh, for example, in case of HSTS, uh, which is used to uh, deploy complete HTTP application, and in CSP, uh, like in HSTS, a browser would just store this information, and uh, uh, the the website will always be loaded on HTTPS, no matter what uh, user tries to load. But in case of CSP, it has to be uh, applied every time uh, on every page request. And so, because browser doesn't cache the policy. And so, CSP basically helps in uh, mitigating cross-site scripting attacks and securing form submissions where, you know, it allows uh, restricting browser to send information to any other locations, like, uh, like in case of password managers, let's say, if they are stealing your credentials, and actually CSP can, CSP can help in those scenarios where, you know, uh, data exfiltrations can be uh, really uh, solved. And, and you can also mitigate uh, click jacking using CSP. And the most in interesting part is uh, doing uh, HTTPS migration, and which is kind of very easy for uh, uh, the application which are very, uh, uh, very old and you do not need to write certain code to migrate and it can be really helpful in that. So let's get started. Uh, how, do you, how do we add this security header? It's basically, it's a response error where you can see the policy goes here 
and you can define consent security policies uh, with this particular header. And it looks like this, where you have set up particular default source as a self, which means that it allows loading resources from the same origin. Uh, so what same origin is, uh, we really need to understand here. Self is same origin, and the origin comprises of three components. Uh, one is the schema, the second is the host name, and third is the port. And, and if when we talk about same origin, if any of these components is different, then it would not uh, be on the same origin. For example, uh, if there's a site called CSP Awesome, and if we try to compare with another site, HTTP or CSP origin, it will not be on the same origin. And when we say it's not on the same origin, browser would not be uh, sharing this resources like cookies, or <laughs> local storage, and other information uh, uh, provided by the browser. Uh, so, so there are certain type of CSP uh, directives which could help you to define CSP policy. And the first one is a script source where you can define what uh, JavaScript uh, elements you need to put inside your application. The major risk involved in putting in this directive was to solve hexx. And the style source could be helpful in uh, loading resources like um, CSS, style sheets. And the major risk is uh, uh, website defacement or stealing of information like CSRF tokens. And image source can actually be very risky where you know someone can send information to their own domain by appending the information, the query params. And similarly, we have other source directive like connect source, which is for uh, XML HTTP request, that is EJAX, and other WebSocket requests to be defined by this. And uh, we have some other source directive like frame source, which could be used for uh, loading the iframes in inside your application. And then we have font source to define your fonts loaded on your website. And then there's an interesting thing called default source, which act as a fallback when you do not specify any of the fetch directive. Uh, when I say fetch directive, which is always appended by uh, 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 hyphens SRC. So in, his exa in an example, if I uh, f uh, fail to write script source, it would, it would, uh, the browser would look for default source. And that's how it becomes uh, a fallback. So in this particular example, where we have defined image source as a star, and this is act as a wildcard, which allow, so, uh, so in this particular case, it allows any images except the uh, blob, data, or file system schemas. And <coughs> so it's not advisable to wildcard, to use wildcard unless you are very sure about it. And then we have other source expression like none, so in this example, we have said object source is none. Uh, it prevents loading plugins from any source. And when we say, say about plugins like Flash or any other uh, plugins which could lead to vulnerabilities. And uh, for example, uh, we have style source as example.com. In this way, you can specify certain domains where you uh, trust those domains and you can easily uh, allow them to uh, load the resources on your website. So in this case, we have allowed uh, the style sheet to be loaded from the specific example.com. And if you want to specify more, and you can uh, uh, keep them uh, uh, separated with a space. And a simple policy looks like this, where we have defined script source as self, object source as none, base URL as none. And so, this policy actually does allow uh, external scripts which are not hosted on your domain, and also it doesn't allow inline script elements where, or like event handlers, like in this case, image on error. Uh, and also, the object source says that uh, it should not be able to uh, host any, any interactive content, like I said before, it's like Flash or and then base URI makes sure that it should not break any scripts which are using the relative paths. And so this is kind of a very uh, secure policy which you can start with. But there are some 
bad ideas where people uh, try to put unsafe inline or unsafe eval, and CSP by default doesn't allow any inline JavaScript, and that's the basic idea behind preventing cross-site scripting attacks. But so uh, in this case where someone tries to uh, define unsafe inline or eval, they're actually allowing an uh, inline source of elements such as style attributes, on-click scripts, tag bodies, or any eval functions, which is kind of dangerous. And But there are some cases where <laughs> you really need to have some kind of inline scripts. For example, uh, you have some code like uh, Google Analytics code, which can have some performant impact, and you do not want to uh, move that file somewhere or do not want to load, load it there, and it has to be in line. There are certain ways you can put those scripts, and also the uh, some legacy applications where you want to uh, allow inline scripting, then you can basically do uh, things like putting them in the external files so that you can put it as a source expression itself, so it will be loaded on your own domain. And also, you can use other strategies like hash, nuns, or script dynamic. And we'll be discussing that as well. <laughs> so when I talk about hash, and you have a script called alert, and you want to convert into a hash, you have basically do a base64 encoding of this particular hash and using a SHA algorithm, which could be uh, 256 or 384 or 512. And if you give that expression, it could uh, give you an ex uh, and base64 encoded value, which you can put it in the setter, in the header, and it looks like this, and which would allow only this exact script that can be run <laughs> in your browser. And if you allow this, then uh, no other scripts would be allowed to execute. Uh, so th these approaches uh, are some, some, sometimes very hard to maintain when, let's say, when you have more than 10 inline scripts and, uh, and you frequently change those scripts. It's very hard to have back and forth changing the application and talking to your devs and the uh, DevOps guy to update those uh, headers in the server. So we have another approach called nuns, where you can define a nuns in your content security policy header. And this nuns has to be a cryptographically securely random generator. And, and it would allow any script with the nuns attribute uh, given as the same as the header. The browser would be checking and allowing only those scripts which matches the nuns. So this is how Twitter CSP looks like. And even it could not uh, fit my uh, browser screen, I mean the presentation screen. And this is uh, where they are using the nuns approach and they're whitelisting all the uh, domains. It's kind of, uh, you know, you have, it's very hard to make sure that these domains are very secure and no vulnerability occurs on those domains. And it's very hard to do it right. And so that we have something called strict dynamic. And this source ex expressions are uh, provided in the script source. It uh, basically gives a complete trust to an applications where, uh, in this uh, particular example where uh, Twitter was uh, allowing different source, font source, media source, which were actually required by certain script elements. And it could have been easily prevented with a strict dynamic and where you basically trust a given piece of code and uh, you allow them to do each and everything what they are doing. And so that it basically allows you to uh, not have a, a bunch of uh, domains which could uh, get compromised and if you do not take care of them in the right way. And so basically when you have a strict dynamic uh, uh, source expression present, it, the browser would ignore the whitelisted domains, and it will only allow the domain which are having hash and nuns representation. Um, so we have talked about these approaches, how how these approaches are actually helping XSX. Let's let's see that. Uh, so in this example where we have a, a script source of cell, and we are allowing a domain called api.google.com. And when someone tries to inject a script, which is coming from an evil.com, uh, it says refuse to load the script. And this is how you violated the content security policy. Uh, 
So I can uh, give a quick demo uh, where we have uh, given this vulnerability, and it could be I would just uh, so I would just quickly set the header as CSP. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to. Put that in the screen. Demos are hard. Anyways, so the screen is flickering. Uh, I would actually have the header set by myself. And if we try to load these expressions, This was working five minutes ago, but anyways. So going forward, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, mitigating access X and uh, let's talk about some common mistakes where default source will be used as a fallback and uh, you actually have to you know, avoid uh, using wildcard domains and default source would be omitted uh, if you do not specify it, and it's, it's not very advisable to do that. And use of dangerous elements like uh, unsafe inline, unsafe eval, and also whitelisting domain with JSONP endpoints, user uploads, or uh, open redirects are dangerous. And if you want to break some stuff, uh, GitHub explicitly invites researcher to break their CSP policy, and HackerOne has also paid, have some paid bounty uh, CSP bypass, and Dropbox is also having a, a, a CSP journey blog where, you, where they have published some interesting articles about how they have uh, migrated their uh, journey from having a CSP, not having CSP to having CSP. Uh, now that uh, we have uh, understood how CSP works, and now how, how should we deploy uh, CSP to our production, and there are two ways where you can actually, uh, the first one can be used to block and report attacks, uh, this enforcing it, and the second one is the report only where uh, you can uh, allow the report, report abuses to a specific reporting server. And when we, when I say about the reporting, you can actually uh, have the policy with the header content security policy uh, report only, and you have to specify a reporting URL where the logs would be uh, sent to. And uh, for this, you can use reporturi.com, which could be uh, very easy to maintain and um, get uh, get a complete idea about these logs. And now let's move on to uh, uh, interesting approach where you can use CSP to migrate uh, to HTTPS. And uh, life is about to go harder for the website having non-HTTPS. And Chrome is actually going to mark uh, all the web non-HTTPS website as non-secure uh, non uh, starting July 2018. And 
Uh, HTTP migration is uh, very hard for legacy applications where you know you have to uh, do a lot lot of code based uh, refactoring and and thus you uh, you can specify a directive uh, called default source uh, which is set to HTTPS and a form action which says to HTTPS which you using which you can identify what all assets are loading using uh, uh, HTTP. And also, it helps you in secure identifying where the secure form submission is not happening. Uh, so when someone try to load an image using HTTP, it would also violate the policy. And there is something. Uh, there is a so uh, there is a directive called upgrade into your secure request, which would basically uh, upgrade all your. HTTP request to HTTPS, and for example, you have an image uh, which is loaded on HTTP. Uh, before sending uh, the request to the server, the browser would con convert that request into HTTPS, and thus doing all of your work uh, without uh, specifying these uh, specific changing the schemas in your code base. And you just need to apply this particular directive in your content security policy, and this can be combined with our other. Uh, fetch directives, and so next one, everybody. I would uh, want to talk about click jacking. Um, everyone thinks that it's a solved problem, uh, where you know it's uh, this one, everybody. Basically, is a malicious technique where you can trick a user into clicking uh, into a something different. What user sees that and. Uh, if a user is able to click on that, he would be uh, actually compromising uh, some confidential information, or even uh, it could lead to account takeover. Basically, it looks like this, where you be, you're trying to click on a button, and it, it gives you uh, something different. Uh, I have a demo for this. but. Uh, See how it works. So I have an application so, uh, which has a feature called uh, delete sensitive information. And with GDPR coming alone, uh, along, uh, you must be developing this particular feature for each and every uh, applications. And when you have such uh, critical uh, uh, user actions, and I try to uh, so we have an application running on host 3000, and I have another application running on 3002. So uh, the, this, uh, these two applications do not rely on the same origin, and user would not be able to uh, share any of the resources. Now, if you see this particular website where uh, I have set the opacity as uh, very, very low, and you can basically see the iframe, this. And when you try to click on this button to see awesome dog flips, and you are actually clicking on something different, and and here, uh, if you are able to see that there's a pop-up coming on that the data has been deleted, and so using this particular approach where people are uh, hiding some information on their browsers uh, behind an iframe, the user are actually making people think that clicking on something else. And But we have seen that these vulnerabilities can be uh, easily solved using a header call X-frame options, but with the, with the support like deny, which will not, uh, there's a, a parameter where you can define deny, which will not allow the website to be iframed. And then you have same origin, which could allow only the, the same origin website uh, to iframe the website. And then you have something called allow from, which is not supported by IE and Chrome, and which allows you to define a URI, which where you want to allow the iframe to be uh, loaded. And But interestingly, uh, we have these two approaches where same origin and allow from works uh, very differently, where the expected behavior would be to check the domains, uh, the ancestor domain. And actually, they are checking the top-level domain to the current domain. So 
to have it understand in a better way uh, where someone is able to uh, inject an iframe inside a page, which is loaded on victim.com, and they have inserted another frame. It's like an inception uh, where you are loading in tacker.com and inside you are loading in victim.com. Now the browser would check the top domain and the current domain. And instead, they should have checked uh, in a very insister path, and which is not being supported by X-frame option, which is kind of wrong. So how, how is it a problem uh, where you have the site that uh, frame untrusted pages? That would be wonderful. And while I was uh, creating slides for content security policy, I was using slides.com. And when I tried to load uh, the response header, and I can see uh, X-frame options are same origin policy, uh, same origin uh, attribute. And if it's there, I am able to uh, add HTML, where I was able to add uh, the iframe. And, and it was wonderful. I reported the vulnerability. And I got a free upgrade, yeah. Uh, so how do we pretend, uh, prevent a click jacking using CSP? There is a directive called frame and sisters where you can uh, define as none that it would not allow uh, any website to iframe it. And similarly, we can specify multiple domains along with self. That means same origin. And uh, similarly, we have uh, other approaches uh, using which you can prevent such type of attack where you can combine both X-frame options and CSP where you know the CSP is supported by a majority of new browsers and uh, old browsers like below uh, Chrome 30 would not basically support some of the directives. So you can apply both the approaches and browser will take care of it. So CSP is kind of cool. You can do a lot of stuff, do not break stuff. Uh, I have another demo in place where I would not open my editor again. <laughs> it could not break. I have an exploit, which I can copy and put that inside. A so there was the XSX, which we have seen on this particular page. Now you can see that there was an exploit, which I have copied, and I have shared the URL with them. But what actually happening at the back? I open my developer console. I uh, have. I was actually uh, running a crypto mining, uh, that is crypto jacking, which I have been talking about from since beginning. And I have been running and generating some good gold crypto mining. And to basically, uh, where I was able to collect all these hashes. And if you visit this particular, and if you try to run this particular application on your browser, uh, you would actually be helping me giving some money. That's how you can respond to my talk. Are you? Uh, so yeah, CSP was cool. Uh, if you want to deploy it, do not break the production. You can use content security report only header. And you can, if you want to learn more, you can have a reference guide, which is on contentsecuritypolicy.com. Follow this guy, Scott. And actually, he was the one who was uh, able to identify all this uh, website, got infected with crypto jacking last week, and helping with the website, government website as well. And he knows uh, his stuff. He knows about CSP. And also, you have a, a useful scripts on this particular URL. And I'm, I'm also going to publish some uh, a handbook which I was actually working on. So that's all I got for the today's talk. Uh, thank you very much. And you can follow, if you have any questions, I'll be right, uh, right here. And uh, if uh, you can follow me on GitHub or Twitter if you have any questions.
I'll just... Yeah, questions. May I start one with a question? Yeah. Um, PWAs, progressive web apps, uh -huh. they require, they're based on HTTPS. How far do I really need then content security policy? Uh, so all these applications where uh, you have to define actually uh, content security policy and going forward, these would be mandatory by the browsers. And it's basically, even if you, uh, I have, honestly, I have never worked with PWA, but I would actually say that if PWA are going, moving towards secure context, there is a CDPS, and they would make sure that CSP is also being followed by them.